good to have you on an Easter Sunday night. We're going to begin our service with two baptisms. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good evening. evening. It's wonderful to be up in the baptismal pool again. We've got two special, very special candidates for baptism. Our first is Mr. Lincoln Dixon. Lincoln, come on down. Lincoln is very excited, as he should be. Come on down, buddy. All right, you see everybody? Can you see everybody? There they are. All right, now turn like this for me. Lincoln, is it true that you've made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Yes. It's upon that profession of faith that I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death. Raised to walk in new life. Next, Mr. Dylan Leonard. Come on down, Dylan. Dylan, is it true that you've made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Yes, sir. It's upon that profession of faith that I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of the dead, raised to walk in new life. Jeremy? Jesus is alive and well. Hallelujah. 
Jesus is alive. Death has lost its victory, and the grave has been denied. Jesus lives forever. He's And last is He. The curse of sin is broken, and we have perfect liberty. The Lamb of God is risen. He's alive. He's alive. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Father, we thank you tonight for giving us another service and, Lord, giving us an opportunity to express our worship unto you, King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, I pray tonight would be a blessing to somebody's heart tonight, but most of all, I pray we're a blessing to your heart, Lord. Humble us and bring us forth together. Cleanse us and clean us and make us more like you. Lord, as we have uh, studied mercy, I pray we show mercy one to the other. Something we all need to learn even more of. And I just pray, Lord, that you would put these things in our hearts and our lives that we might represent you more greatly upon a dark and cold world. We ask these things in Jesus' name. All the people said, Amen. All right, be seated. And uh, we're going to welcome guests. We've got some guests here. They're here for the baptism. Came all the way from the foreign country of Virginia. And uh, they're here. But uh, before that, I do want to recognize somebody that is here. And we are grateful that she is okay, Miss Page. We are very grateful you are okay. It could have been bad. But we do have a plaque that says Barney Five Award, all right? All right. All right. I'm kidding you. I'm kidding you. We love you. Glad that you're all right, okay? Welcome our guests. If you're not a member of our church, remain seated. We're going to put a card in your hand. Y'all been here before, you know the thing, you can put it in the offering plate at the end of the service. All right? Let's stand up, welcome one another.
sing with me, church. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Thank you. You may be seated. the tomb of Buddha I looked inside and saw his bones I traveled on to see Muhammad still wrapped up in his grave clothes then I journey to a garden where old Joseph left him lay. The precious lamb, God's own begotten, he was no longer in the grave and if you knew him like I know him you would know that he's alive if you felt him like I feel him resurrection Deep inside, you know he's living, and death, death has died. If you're wandering in the darkness, come and step into his light. Those nail-scarred hands reach out to help you, to pull you safe from death to life. Friend, I too have stood where you stand. Could I trust? In things unseen Oh, but just one step In His direction And then in love He ran to me If you knew Him Like I know Him then you would know that He is alive If you felt Him 
like I feel in the resurrection deep inside you know he's living and death has died chapter 5, and then we're going to look in Psalms, Matthew chapter 5, we're just going to be in Psalms for a little while tonight, looking at mercy, finishing up the messages on mercy, since we didn't read Matthew 5, I want to read it for you tonight, and then as I'm thinking before I get started, Brother Danny, didn't you tell me going out the back door they told you you were cancer free this week? Is that true? God bless you. All right. And then I don't, I have no idea. I want to tell you, being spring break, uh, I weigh several factors when it comes to Easter. And to be honest with you, I've gotten to where I don't always every Sunday worry about the crowds. I've got tired of fighting the culture and this, that, and the other, and all the ins and outs. You know something, we had a great crowd this morning, especially with it being spring break. Plus, I can tell you this, 12 families now called me yesterday that were planning on being here who either were sick, lost a family member, or were sent to the hospital. And that's 12 more families. I don't know where we'd have put them this morning. And then I want to compliment you because when I got out here between Sunday school and, and church, the front parking lot was about 90% empty, and that one was pretty empty. When I walked out the back door this morning after church, of course most of you, a lot of you parked at the bottom of the hill or down the street or in the back or on the grass parking lot, which I asked you to do that. All these guests, and we had a house full of guests this morning, and I'm going to tell you that front parking lot and side parking lot that you left for them was absolutely full and packed when I got out there this morning. And so God bless you crowds, you did your job and I am grateful for it. And uh, I know most of you don't understand that, but a preacher understands it. I, it. There's nothing more frustrating than to try to get folks here and get them saved and all of this, and they, they, they just drive off when they pull up to the parking lot when it's full. And so uh, I know some of you will go, well, it's not that important, and da 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 Listen, keep parking on the grass. There's a day, one of these days, with all these other lists we've got, I want to buy us a six-seater enclosed golf cart to take us up and down the hill, because our crowds are going to be so big, we're going to need the bottom parking lot every Sunday, not just on Easter Sunday. Amen? Amen. And so uh, thank all of y'all that helped us and did all of those things. And so anyway, all right, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 5, it was a great day and a great morning. All the way through and all. Oh, and Brother Phil, Brother Phil, he'll not be here next Sunday, and he asked if he could go this afternoon, and I want to say this gently because most of y'all know, uh, Phil, Phil and Diane are kind of private about their illnesses and things of that nature, but most of you know this. Miss Diane is really struggling physically and with her physical issues and this, that, and the other. And this is their spring break, and he asked me, I said, Phil, get her out there. They love to camp. They've got that new camper, and it is a great plus for her health to just go and get out from under the stress. I don't understand what this is that's in her eyes, but it's, it's very touchy and just getting some good rest. And I said, Phil, get out of here. And he said he'd pull in late next Sunday night. They're going to enjoy kids and this, that, and the other, and just let Miss Diane just sit and rest. And so 
Uh, that's why he's not here tonight. And Jeremy, God bless you, you did a great job. Amen. All right, beginning in verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And then as we saw the second message on mercy this morning, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now... Turn over to Psalms chapter 4, and uh, you don't have to keep up with Matthew. We're going to be in Psalms all tonight. Psalms chapter 4, and we're going to walk through Psalms very quickly and just look at some of the passages upon mercy as we apply them and get application out of them that David, my Bible's gotten messed up, so hang on with me a minute and I'll get there. Matthew chapter 4, just verse 1, hear me when I call, O God. Of my righteousness, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. And Father, we thank you tonight and pray that, Father, that uh, you'd give us a great service tonight as we think even deeper and more about mercy, one of the greatest characteristics that we need to understand and learn. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you be seated. Now, we are thinking, and I want us to think even more. In fact, I have to be honest that uh, the, the Beatitudes have been such a great blessing into my heart of being able to study them. And really the one on mercy, that is the one that uh, a lot of them, they got my attention, but mercy really, really got my attention. And I had quoted it for years and years and years. But this principle that uh, we found even deeper this morning about the certain things that, that if you don't do them like Christ did them, then all of a sudden everything stops. Everything stops. And even in the Old Testament, we know about mercy. That means if you've got unforgiveness this morning, Jesus said, you may be saved and born again, but you can't be walking with Him in unforgiveness towards a brother. If you don't grant mercy, He doesn't pour out mercy upon you. He poured out mercy upon you to save you and to help you and to guide you, to give you salvation. Mercy is the one thing and characteristic we must have. And then the other thing is this, is that we must be merciful one to the other. Now listen to me. The day you got saved in heaven, in that position, there was a blank check put in the Lamb's book of life with your name on it, meaning all sin has been wiped out. Listen to me. One of the things that we have to learn about mercy is this, is that I, when I give mercy to them that have wronged me or been vindictive or I have been in a conflict with, when I give mercy to them, that means I wipe out the debt that I believe they owe to me. That is the background of what happened with David. Now, when we think about King David, we know all of the issues and all the difficulties of what he had. And I went in there this afternoon and I just pulled out my uh, uh, concordance and began to look at all the things that were in the book of Psalms, and the word mercy is there about 47 different times, and I don't have time to go through all of them, but I began to look at some of them and just walk with them and began to understood that here was King David, and one of the reasons why he went through that roller coaster of life like he did and then finally came to the point that he was a man after God's own heart is because he personally was a very merciful man. He followed God, God gave him mercy, and he gave mercy. Remember when he gave mercy to King Saul and did not take his life. He gave mercy to the armies of the Nazarites because they had attacked him in a wrong manner. And then he gave mercy to many other people. In fact, King David was known among men, even with his sinfulness with Bathsheba, he was known as one of the most merciful kings of all time. And when he gave mercy, God gave him mercy back. So I want us to just see some of those passages of Scripture. We've already seen the first one. You hear David cry out, Have mercy upon me. Hear my prayers. What he's saying. Now, this is what he's saying. Lord, I am in distress. And I need mercy upon me. The background of Psalms chapter 4 is the fact that probably David was in a time period where he was being attacked by an enemy of some kind or an army of the outside. 
I don't understand it completely, but listen to me very carefully. From the fall of man until the day of Jesus coming back, Satan is always going to have those who will hate the Jewish people. And much of David's problems were with people that he had never even had any problem with at all. And so he's crying out to God in distress, Lord. Here I am again in conflict. Here I am again in problem. Here I am again, and, and, and I just can't seem to get out of this. I'm a man that is chosen by God. Now listen, that's what some of us begin to think tonight. We think, well, listen, Lord, why is it I'm going through all of these troubles and all of these difficulties and all of these problems? Well, you may have created some of them by poor choices and sinfulness and things of that nature. Or you may just be a child of God and understand the world is going to be filled with stress and difficulty and problems. And you've got an enemy in this world. And you need to pry, cry up on God's heart and say, Lord, have mercy upon me. And as I learn to give more mercy to people, then Lord, I want you to give me mercy in my conflicts and my problems and the struggles. And Lord, instead of me saying, why did this happen to me and why am I going through this? Sometimes we just need to accept that it comes out of the hand of God. And it is a lesson in us seeing that he is going to be merciful unto each and every one of us. I dare say of all the Beatitudes... Probably mercy is the least practiced one in the modern day church today, especially in America. In America, we have just got the mentality that uh, we're educated and we're wealthy compared to the rest of the world. We've got all of these things given. Can we just be honest, really, and just say we're a pretty selfish people when it comes to comparison of the Word of God? Would you be honest with that? We are. We like our comfort. We like our, our new cars. Sorry, honey. Had to get it in, all right? We like our uh, new homes. We, we, we want our furniture a certain way. Listen, the poorest people in America are some of the wealthiest people in the world. We are a selfish, self-centered people. And we lack many times the patience and the mercy that God has with us to give to other people. That's the whole lesson of the Beatitude. That is the application. Number two, I want you to go to chapter 5. Look down at verse 7 just across the page. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercies, and in the fear will I worship towards the holy temple. Now, remember that David was an Old Testament saint of God. And he is king of all of Israel. He is probably the wealthiest man upon the face of the earth. He is wealthier, we believe, than what Nebuchadnezzar was, which was an incredible wealthy king later on in life. David may have been... For a thousand or two thousand years, one of the most wealthiest men to ever walk the face of the earth. And here he says, I come into your house, I see the multitude of thy mercy, and I fear and I will worship towards thy holy temple. Now remember what we saw this morning out of the Old Testament. The centerpiece of the Holy Holies was the mercy seat where the blood was shed, and even King David was not allowed to go behind in the Holy of Holies. Only a priest on the Day of Atonement could go in and beg for mercy unto the Lord. And yet David said, I come into thy house. And I cry out for mercy. I need mercy, Lord, just to enter into your presence. He had a fear that he would be unclean in such a manner. He wanted to enter in in a clean heart and in the right attitude and in the right manner. My word, if we'd ever capture that again, revival would break out across this nation if we did it in this church right now. Most of us can strut sitting down with pride. That's our heart in America. And David, the king of Israel, is saying, Humble me is what it really means. I am overwhelmed at the multitudes of thy mercy. Think about the mercy he's having on America today. God having mercy upon us, yes. I think with all the sin of America... If it weren't for the mercy of God, we'd already be judged completely out of history with what's going on in America. We've shook our fist in His face so often over the last several years. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, I'll tell you one of the things I was talking about. I like the little news report that they gave the other night, but they cut out about 30 minutes of what she asked me. And I was sitting at my desk, and she asked me a very probing question, and I knocked her off her feet, and she dropped her microphone when I answered her. She did sitting upstairs, she said to me, she said, 
Pastor Mike, don't you believe that the most evil person in America is somebody that would come into a church of the house of God and kill innocent people? And I said, no, I do not. I believe a doctor in an abortion clinic is more evil than they are. Of course they're evil when they're a mad mind and will come in and shoot innocent people. But David, king of Israel, understood that the hand of God stayed upon his nation and it stayed there because of the mercy of God. Number three is found in chapter 6. David continues to walk with God in a magnificent manner. And look in uh, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore and vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? Now, some of you are going to miss this. You say, well, is David physically sick? No, he is not. He's humbled in his heart, and he understood he was spiritually dead and blind in his sin. And the, and the idea here is that he is weak because of the sinfulness that is all around him. He is crying out to God to cleanse him and to grant him mercy upon his heart. Did you know that in every great revival, the first thing that comes forth is a brokenness over the smallest of sin? We see the countenance of sin and what it cost. Now when we talked about mercy this morning, we need to remember that justice and mercy go together and that when sin is in our life, it was paid for with the most incredible price and the most important time and the most important event upon the face of the earth. It was the cross and the crucifixion of Christ. Hebrews says, Dare we? take advantage of the blood of Jesus by trampling underfoot the things of God? He is saying to us that how can we look at God in such a manner and just continue to go on and live the way we do and not ever understand what it was He paid for? That's what Hebrews was talking about. And David is crying out here, Lord, I am weak spiritually, I am weak physically, I am bound down, I humble myself, and Lord God, I need mercy in my life just to even look at You. Now, let's go to the next one. Look over at chapter 9 and look at verse 13 and see what he says. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, and consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me, and thou that liftest me up from the gates of death. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me, thou that liftest me up from the gates of death. Now, He is calling out again, and he is crying unto God that war is fixing to happen. That's the background of this passage of Scripture. War is fixing to happen. Innocent blood is fixing to be spilt. And here is this one that David is crying out, and he is saying, Lord, have mercy upon me. Give me wisdom, he says later. I need all of the ability as king, as the anointed one, to cry out to you, Lord, to protect my people. Now, there's a principle there that comes out of the midst of this passage of Scripture in the example of David. Listen to this. You and I are going to get to heaven one day, and I believe that the Lord will show us that out of His mercy, He protected us and shepherded us and took care of us in times of trouble in things we never saw and even understood were fixing to happen to us. Out of His grace and mercy, He takes care of us even in our blind spots that we never see here upon His earth. And remember in the Beatitudes, we are taught that grace and love and mercy are all flowing out of one another. And all of these things are given to us. And we're going to find out that as the demons of hell planned our our demise, God began to come and intervene and many times sent the angels of God or the Spirit of God. And at times where war was breaking out spiritually in our lives, He is intervening in that midst and helping us. Things take place in spiritual warfare that no man ever knows about. If we could split the heavens open tonight and see all the demonic warfare and the angels that are fighting and all the things that are happening in the protective hand of God, we would see the mercy of God Upon us and who we are. You know, we, uh, 
I forgot to announce this this morning, but uh, we finally got the internet up. We've got it fixed. We are worldwide on the net this morning. And it was fixed. My daughter and husband, her husband watched us this morning, and uh, I was really thrilled to see all of y'all. But my wife gets a text that says, our little Gabrielle saw her pop on the TV or on the internet, whatever, and she got up and she kissed her pop on the screen. Remember, she's the criminal. (laughs) You know what we need to pray? Lord, out of mercy, send that message all over the world because there's very few churches that preach the message like we do today. There's very few that are going to sing the songs of grace and the blood and tell the truth like we do today. I'm praying that tens of thousands of people one day begin to watch us on the internet all over the world. I've already sent messages into Africa and Korea and Israel and other places. I've got 5,000, I don't have 5,000 friends on my Facebook. I don't know, 3,000 or or, or 3,500 of them. Some of them I've heard of, but I've never met them. I kept them on there for one reason. I want them to have an opportunity all over the world to know who we are. They didn't have that in David's day. But David cries out, Lord, you can see things I cannot see. War is upon my nation. War and difficulty and danger is coming. War is here, Lord. Give me mercy. Now, look over at chapter 13 and let's read the whole passage of Scripture. There's just six verses there. Chapter 13. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemies be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Light mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. And I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. Now listen. Do you know what David was saying? David had gotten to the point that he understands he could not trust the earth that he was sitting upon. There was only one place to trust, and that is under the shadow of the mercy of the Almighty God's hand. And he is trustworthy beyond what any man's experience can be. We're living in the same kind of day that David did in many ways because of this reason. Here's the issue. You and I can look around. We can pick up the paper. We can look at uh, things. and We can see CNN, the Communist News Network. And it's all it is is bad news. Who wants to trust in this world? If it was left to this world, the madmen would have already blown the place up. But because of the Almighty God's hands that we can trust in, I'll tell you, everything in this book will become true and everything He said will happen in the exact manner that He has said that it will happen. He will say, listen, even in troubled waters that I cannot see in chapter 9 and in these troubles, I will trust in the Lord God Himself and in the multiplied mercies of His heart. Chapter 18, verse 30. Look over at it. I don't want to be long tonight. I want you to get on home and out of here. Listen to what he says. Excuse me. Is that right? Verse 35. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and the right hand hath holden me, and the gentleness has made me great. Now listen. The word gentleness there is a cousin word to the word mercy. I had to look this up in the Hebrew Because I wanted to see it. He is saying, I'm a shield for your heart. I am here for you in whatever I have for you. And when I come, I will deliver you. Now, watch. Look at verse 50 of the same chapter. Great deliverance giveth he to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. There's a prophecy in that psalm. He says, here's the seed of David. Well, where did the seed of David go? Well, the seed of David started in the seed of Abraham. The seed of Abraham was the seed of David. The seed of David flaunted all the way to the seed of Bethlehem. 
And the perfect seed of God came. And as he says, I will protect the anointed one, he is saying, Jesus Christ is going to do everything that he said he's going to do, and it will be completed, and forevermore we will worship this anointed King of kings and Lord of lords. It's merciful for God to come and get his children. It's merciful for him to even intervene in this world and in this land. Now, two more and we'll be done. Chapter 21. Look over at chapter 21 and look down, I believe it's verse 7. For the king trusteth in the Lord, through the mercy of the Most High, watch this, he shall not be moved. He shall not be moved. Now listen, it takes mercy today to stand in quality truth. What are they doing to us today? They're redefining marriage. This church is taking the stand unequivocally. It doesn't matter what the law said. doesn't matter what Obama says. doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says. We will not be moved on the quality of biblical marriage. Can't do it. It's going to take mercy, grace, and love to not be moved. You say, how important is it? Let me tell you what. Three institutions are given to us in the Bible. The government, the Holy Church of God, and the temple, and marriage. You don't redefine what God has already defined. I'll guarantee you, people, even in the church, will put pressure on you to redefine those things. It's happening everywhere. All over churches, in Baptist churches, all kinds of churches. Now, we don't have to be ugly or angry or unkind to anybody. But listen, we must tell the truth. That's the reason why we're in the kind of shape we're in, is we, we stop telling the truth. It doesn't matter what, the, what they think or what they want to redefine. It is the truth. Marriage is for one man and for one woman for life. God has second chances for those who can't get through that. But that is the standard. It is not defined any way else. Truth has to be applied. Now, let's just do one more. Then there's mercy for life. My favorite psalm. And all the Bible, I can quote it to you. Psalm 23. And what is it that he says at the very bottom of the passage? Surely goodness and mercy shall do what? It'll follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you know this? You have to have mercy every day. To be able to get through life. David said, mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. All the days of my life. And then I go and I dwell in the house of the Lord. You know, Miss Tucker right across the street came home. She told her family. She said, I'm at that time. I don't want to die in Georgia. I want to die in Tennessee. I want to die at my house or at my home or at my place. She's in the hospital right now. I don't know that she's close. I've been there three times. She is so sound asleep, there's all I've been able to do is leave a card. But she understands what is taking place right here. When you get ready, because I want to tell you something. In fact, I, I, the first time I went in, I kind of pushed on her shoulder and said, Miss Tucker, Miss Tucker, nothing. Second time, I just looked. You know, she's got a peacefulness about her as she lays there and sleeps. She is saying goodbye to the world that God gave her mercy in. And out of mercy, she's going home to the house of the Lord. We're not meant to live on this earth forever and ever. I don't know if it's now or three weeks from now or three months from now for her. But I know this. She sleeps peacefully because she's in the hand of mercy. You know, I don't understand it. I have stood there at a few funerals, not many. I wondered where that old gentleman or that old boy went that was laid in that casket. You know, it's amazing to me that when somebody dies, everybody wants to claim that that individual is going to heaven. Just have the hardest time to believe and think that here's a man that never confessed Christ, never turned his heart to the Lord, never did anything, and he's automatically going to heaven. Let me tell you something. For you to believe that makes Jesus a liar. 
How important is mercy? Without mercy, I can't leave this earth and go to the heaven that's been prepared for me. I've earned none of it. I've gained none of it. He gives it to me freely. Now listen, some of you want to redefine mercy, and since we're on mercy, you need to hear me. Mercy given to you to another individual is somebody who sends something to you and they deserve nothing. That's true mercy. That means you were on the receiving end of something very wrong and you've granted full forgiveness and full mercy as if nothing ever happened. You say, well, don't I need to hold them accountable for something? Well, we could get into that tonight, possibly. Accountability is part of justice and mercy. But if you and your heart are making lists of things, well, they did this and this and this and this and this. You've not granted mercy. God gave you mercy 100% and you were a full enemy of God till you said yes to Him. Real mercy is given to them who have hurt us the most. That's what Jesus was talking about to all of His people. Mercy is something that is a natural aspect of the character of God. I'm not sure that mercy is a natural aspect of any of us. It's something we have to focus on, look at it, and be empowered by the Spirit to begin to do it. It means I have to go through the list of people in my mind. The list of events in my mind. And I have to say, now Lord, I can't fix that back there. I can't do anything about what that is. But Lord, I'm going to give Him the same mercy you gave me. Now, you're going to say, Brother Mike, that's not fair. Think about David and all the enemies he had that hated him. He confessed it. You see, in the end, everybody is going to be put in the hands of God. Everybody will kneel and say He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And every single thing will be corrected in the end. And everyone will give an account for what they are and who they are. You don't have to worry about justice. God gives justice. He commands us to give mercy. I want you to be careful because the definition is much broader than what I've been able to cover in three weeks. That doesn't mean you get run over. Doesn't mean you become somebody's doormat. Not at all. But it means you quit kicking everybody that gets in your way. And see, mercy is a tender attribute of holy God. Out of tenderness, He poured His wrath out on His Son to be tender and merciful to us. What's the message been to us since January? Gentleness. Grace, peace, mercy, forgiveness, hope, joy. What's been driving since January? It just seems like that's been the message of the church. I didn't plan it that way. The most merciful act ever given to man was the day that Jesus died on the cross. You know, when I started preaching the Beatitudes, I had no idea on Easter Sunday I was going to land right on mercy. He's got a plan for everyone. He's got a plan for everyone. You can't receive mercy in your walk with God unless you're willing to give mercy. That's the principle of the beatitude. You have to give mercy to those around you for God to pour out more mercy on you. That's literally what he's saying. I grant mercy. I can't 
explain why they act the way they do, but I give mercy. Because they mistreated me doesn't mean I'm going to mistreat them. Are you getting it? Shake your head. We have been saying this for a long time. I'm going to tell you what. If we really got this, this church would explode. That means we've got to give mercy to each other in here. We've got to give mercy to people. There were people here this morning. I know them. I've been in their homes. I've been in their places. They've come out of the gutter alive. They didn't grow up in the church. They don't get it. You know something, church? That's becoming the culture. That's why it's getting harder and harder to grow churches. It's not a church going crowd out there anymore. They don't know what to do. They come in here, they don't get it. And it's getting broader and broader. You know how we're going to reach them? Not by making them meet all of our standards and rules, but by giving them mercy and love and grace long enough for God to do His work in them. You quit trying to be the Holy Spirit of God in people's lives. Wow, you've been strong with this preacher. Well, remember what Jesus was preaching to just beforehand. Beware of the Pharisees. Beware of them. The fine line between standards and mercy. So you got to go home with it this week. If God gives me mercy to live, I've got to give mercy to others. Lord, we pray tonight that, Father, your, your message would sink deep into our heart and into our life. And Lord, that we'd understand what it is you're teaching us. And I pray for my own heart and life that I would grant mercy. I need mercy for forgiveness of sin in my life. I need mercy for my thoughts and things. And just like everyone that's here, Lord, we need mercy just to walk with you. Grant us that ability to have your character as we focus upon it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.